happy Mother's Day to everyone, right? Especially to all the moms. Okay, uh, thank you for your labor of love, your hard work, all right? The tears also, all right? And the toil and um, a lot of times, you know, you don't get a lot of thanks, all right? Uh, you hear a lot of stuff when things don't work. Or things are not happening. You get you hear the complaints, all right? Otherwise, uh, a lot of times, um, when everything's going smoothly and all that, uh, you hear nothing, all right? But um, I want to kind of spend some time today. Of course, when we gather, we assemble here, uh, our focus is fixed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And so what we're going to do is we're going to spend some time getting into the Word of God uh, today, all right, and this message. So I bring you a message this morning, all right, entitled, right, Church Lessons from David and the Mighty Man. And this is the second part because we did uh, go through a series of messages about this, uh, about David and his mighty men as we were uh, trying, okay? I'm trying, I'm really trying to finish out Second Samuel, okay? It's taken a while, but there's a lot of good stuff here, all right? There's a lot of good stuff. And so um, let's begin with a recap of the last message, and we're going to pick up from where we left off, in, uh, okay, back in March, all right? But we need a more detailed uh, review than we normally would do, okay? Uh, because... It's important here, we, I want to cut, connect to where we were. And then uh, we, it's important, right? We try to glean, that so we get important things from uh, the life of David, all right? And uh, concerning leadership and organization principles. Now, all these things help us, all right, to know how we should function as a church, how we should interact and function uh, with one another uh, in God's house. And, and by the way, in our home and in our family also. Okay, and beginning with this, right, that the last message we dealt with, um, we saw how David encouraged diversity, right? He allowed room for new people uh, to come in and they had a diversity, uh, that means a wide assortment of different special abilities and talents to be added to the mighty men. Now, they had very few, un unlike uh, most situations, they had very few problems uh, integrating these new people uh, because right, there was no demand that all of them have to be the same, Okay. And the Bible describes how that the New Testament church is a local physical body, right? On earth. Okay, on earth is a local physical body where everyone has different roles, parts, and functions. Okay, just like your, your own physical body, right? Your hair. Uh, you realize even the hairs in your nose serve a function. Okay, we don't like to talk about it. It's not, not glamorous. All right. But they serve an important role and function. And, and realize this, that all these are in essential. And because we're connected as parts of the human body, we are, they are, in, we are dependent on one another. All right? There's no such thing as useless. Now, David also entice other people right, with their, uh, who have talent, skills, and ability. Now, some, they, again, they didn't fit, not all of them fit in into the standard right, idea of what the warrior fighting men should be. But they had special abilities. Uh, the Gadites came to David in the wilderness. Now, and, and yet, what happens is this. Um, David took them in and found a place for them. You know, many times what happens is this, right? Uh, you know, in church, people pray oh, that, God, oh, that God will add more people. But then what happens? God brings someone exceptional who has maybe some special ability, and then all next, the next moment, they are now jealous or they feel threatened. They now become very unwelcoming. Why? Because uh, my place and my position is threatened. Right? David found a, a room for everyone. Now, he, David also empowered leaders so that they were able to exercise initiative. Now, the sons of Gad joined up with David. They felt empowered right, by his leadership. They took initiative uh, to cross over uh, and, and then to attack the enemies on the, both the east and the west side of the Jordan River. Even though... Um, it was during a difficult time when the Jordan River was flooding. It was a perfect time. Why? Because nobody expects to be attacked during that time. But was it difficult? Yes. Was it risky? Yes. And yet, here's the thing, right? Because you, you know, even from the, our, if you go to whether it's school or our workplace today, many times our organizations and, and those who are in leadership do not encourage people to take initiative or to take a risk. Why? Because um, you're only supposed to make safe choices. Right? Or to go with uh, the guaranteed options. Okay? Or 
you know, sometimes what happens is this, you, you end up with a church where there is an insecure or egotistical pastor, right, where everything's all about him. No, nothing happens or nothing is allowed to happen unless he says so. Or, or nothing is allowed to happen uh, without him being in the center of the whole thing. And sadly, this is becoming the norm even among Baptist churches. Now, the final point here we, we dealt with in the last message was this, David engendered trust with his people. He quickly put aside the differences, even with enemies. Right? He secured the pledge from the enemies and then said, okay, fine. Uh, and then where there were capable people, he put them in roles of leadership. And so, just as an opening thought here, as we explore all this further, I want us to realize all these things are important as we build up RBM as a church, right? as we reach out to others right, with the gospel of Jesus Christ, and as we uh, join those who are saved into the membership of, of uh, this church. Now, we need to ask ourselves some very important questions. Like, what is the kind of spiritual le leadership that we need? Or we should have based on the word of God. Okay, not based on the current culture or church culture, which sometimes can be corrupt. What does the Bible have to say? All right, what kind of pastor should we have? That's a relevant question because I have to ask myself that question, right? Based on where I need to be, maybe what, where, where do I have to go? What are the things I need to work on in my life? All right, what kind of member should we be? All right, also personally for each and every one of us, right? Do we have to exercise personal leadership in our own lives to take responsibility for our own lives, right? Because we will be accountable to God. And here, all this cannot come from um, just traditions, teachings of men, but from the Word of God and from the working of the Holy Spirit of God in us, right? Because the Word of God will give us principles, pictures, and patterns that we will follow, Okay? Sometimes uh, some of you have asked before, like, why, why do I uh, spend quite a bit of time in the Old Testament? Because there are a lot of principles and pictures and patterns that are laid, they're given, in fact, the New Testament tells us it was given to us as examples. Examples for us, right? Um, sometimes it's a negative example, a lot of, uh, other times it's a positive example, but these are things for us to learn. So let's get down to the main thing, our message for today. And we see uh, what were some of the lessons that we picked uh, in terms of how David went about in his leadership. He was engaging other leaders. Now, turn again, turn with me to 1 Chronicles chapter 13, right? And in 1 Chronicles chapter 13 and 2 Samuel chapter 6, uh, where there is a parallel passage. David's goal and desire was to bring the ark right, of God back into Jerusalem and so he went about doing this not by just pushing ahead with whatever he wanted, not by issuing a decree because, why? Right, I'm king, I can do whatever I want, by consult, but by consulting with the leaders. Now look at First, uh, First Chronicles 13 verse 1. And David consulted with the captains of thousands and hundreds. He didn't stop there. And with every leader. All right? Everyone who was in a position of leadership who was in a position of influence. Now, sometimes a person may have a leadership role and some of you here uh, on the ground have a leadership role because well, you have a tremendous influence on others. You don't have, you may, may not be holding office, you may not be holding a position, but boy, do you have influence. And you know, David went to all these, he gathered them together. Now the word consult here, consulted, means to counsel together, advise, to consult, exchange, deliberate. There was a discussion. All right, there was an exchange of ideas or thoughts or opinions. Now, he gathered all of them at, any, at all these different levels, all right, into this meeting and then to decide what needs to be done. Now, why did he ask, bring in even the junior commanders? Because here there were the captains of hundreds, all right, captain of a hundred. It's, it's, like, it's slightly less than actually uh, an, an infantry company. All right. But he brought them together. Why? Because their input does matter. And collectively, even here, right, the collective input and wisdom is far greater than what one person can have. Look at Proverbs 11 verse 14. 
Then where no counsel is, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. This is a biblical principle, right? Where there is no counsel. That means we all of us do seek advice and counsel from others uh, in life, especially as adults. Okay, but where there's no counsel weapons, you're set for a fall. Is it? But notice where is the safety in a multitude of counselors? Wait, wait a minute. I, I thought if you keep asking, if you ask a multitude of counselors, wouldn't that it make things more difficult, more complicated? Right? There's so many people, so many different opinions, and then what? Well, that's the precisely the thing. You don't go to people who are going to tell you what you expect. That's not seeking counsel. You're asking people to rubber stamp what you've done or what you've already decided. Seeking this kind of counsel, a multitude of counselors, it also means you're going to hear things that may contradict, may oppose, may be different from what you thought. And the point here is that you have to consider all these things. Okay, and very sadly today, we're in the culture today that uh, where there is a different idea from whatever I've already fixed on. I don't want to have anything to do with that person. I don't want to have talk to that person. I don't want to read uh, anything. I don't want to touch the books. I don't want to have any of this, right? And even the ironic thing is the people who claim that they want to be very open-minded about these things are the ones who say, I don't want to have anything to those close-minded people, right? Because I'm very close-minded about this matter. Here, notice this. There is a multitude of counselors now. That means sometimes I want to hear if someone says something different because I may not have seen or noticed something. Ladies, Mother's Day is today, right? But realize this, you know, sometimes... Uh, your husband may be telling you something different because he doesn't, he's not wired to think the same way as you do. And that's not to make your life, God did not put him there to make your life difficult. He sees something that you do not see, but you also see something that he doesn't see. And, you know, the man or the husband or the wife who would be wise to realize, you know, together we are far wiser and we have far more insight than we would have been on our own. Proverbs 15 verse 22 says, Without counsel, purposes are disappointed. You can have a plan, a purpose, but you know what? Something is going to come to failure or disappointment. Says, but in the multitude of counselors, they are established. They are established. Okay? Because there are many, many inputs. Even uh, imagine with the design or put up this building here, um, you cannot just talk to the architect, right? Because the other engineers, the civil engineer, the electrical engineer will go and tell you, oh, we, you, there are some other things you need to consider. All right? Uh, that's how mechanics, right? Uh, they're going to tell you something different or so that you, know, you have to take something else into consideration. So on and so forth. Now, all this helps us make better choices and decisions. Proverbs 20 verse 18, with every purpose is established by counsel. Every purpose. Is it? And with good advice, make war. Why? War is a very complex operation. So many things that you need to take care of, all right, to in order to execute or to do this properly. You know, it was last year that... Uh, you know, Russia went to war and, and, and tried to invade Ukraine. And, you know, within three days, the soldiers, the Russians, were turning back, walking back to the border because they ran out of food. Nobody remembered to bring food. Nobody remembered to bring fuel. They were stuck because it was, a, I think it was like 40 kilometer long traffic jam. There was no council because... Um, the people who were supposed to give advice were only given a very small, limited amounts of information. They say, oh, here's a hypothetical. This is just a, uh, you know, we're just testing out a scenario here, not realizing, turns out uh, that they were supposed, those was, became the actual war and operation plans. Okay, they could not get very good counsel. And I want to realize here that you and I, no, we may not like to hear something different, but it would be wise to set aside pride 
I realized that people who are going to tell you, bothered, who bother to tell you this, are not people who dislike you. Why? Because if I dislike you and you have a terrible plan, I'll just keep quiet. I'll let you fall off the cliff. Why should I tell you anything? I'll just watch. But the people who are going to bother to tell you something are trying to tell you this for your own good, right? for your welfare. Now, Proverbs 24 verse 6 says, For by wise counsel thou shalt make thy war, and in multitude of counselors there is, again, safety. All right? Because why? nobody has a monopoly of good, on good ideas. And you will be arrogant to think that you, you are the only one who ever ha has good ideas. The organizations, companies, and, and even governments that think that way, that they have a monopoly. And guess what? There's a lot of good stuff on the ground. All right? But to, you have to be hum have to humility to be open to these new ideas or even conflicting ideas. Things that are different from our own. And a multitude of counselors means that there is greater likelihood, right? We cover all angles. Okay? Now, there is an eye, there is a mindset uh, which uh, okay, I, I encountered very often okay, with tech companies. It's called not invented here syndrome. What does that mean? In other words, if we didn't come up with the idea, it can't be very good. Why? Because we're the only ones who have the, all the good ideas. All right, we're the only ones who have all the good products. Wait, wait, hang on. It happens also. Oh, if our church didn't come up with this, it was not something that our church did. Oh, that can't possibly be very good. Uh-oh. But you see, there were, David sought to get agreement and also on the plan of what they should do. And then after that, he sought to then expand this to get buy-in and support from others. Look at verse 2. And David said unto all the congregation of Israel, notice, it was no longer just talking to the captains, right, or the leaders, but now to all the congregation of Israel. It says, if it seemed good unto you, right, this, he's seeking a consensus. And if, and that it be of the Lord our God, let us send abroad unto our brethren everywhere. Okay? Now, I just want to focus on that earlier part. That it be of the Lord our God. Why? Again, He's, now, he, what's he doing? He's asking everyone, you judge for yourself. Folks, you, you understand what I'm saying here? David is saying, you think. I want you to think. Okay, this is very different from what we see today in, in a lot of churches. Why? Because pastors know, all right, that the, the, sometimes it's more difficult because there are differing viewpoints and opinions. They don't like that. All right, and they're too weak-minded to try to work with everyone on this. They have to have their way. And next, so what do they want? They want ignorant people. Why? Right? Ignorant people are easier to control and to rule. But here, notice this: if it seem good unto you, and that it be of the Lord our God, that means not only does it have to be a good plan, we have to evaluate: is this of the Lord? Are you praying about this? All right. Are you seeking the will of God concerning this matter? Then this is, a, let us send abroad unto our brethren everywhere that are left in all the land of Israel and with them also to the priests and Levites which are in their cities and suburbs that they may gather themselves unto us. All right. So what happens now? They're reaching out to others. All right. But notice something here. And this is something I've generally uh, done over the last 20 over years, which is, very often, I start with a small group, not because to be elitist or anything like that, because sometimes, actually not sometimes, many times, when we try to work on something new, the chance of failure is high. We need to fail quickly, learn quickly, improve rapidly. Only then do I then roll this out and say, okay, now here's the bigger program across the church. Why? Because we start, we start small. We may not always know what we're doing. Because why? I've been in the tech world long enough to know a lot of times we have to innovate when we don't know everything. You don't have perfect knowledge. That may, be, may not be the case in other areas where things don't move rapidly, but in the fast-changing environment, things move very quickly. 
you don't always know all the answers. No matter how smart you think you are. And smart people, I can guarantee you, I work to a lot of very smart people. Smart people make mistakes. And they learn from their experience. Here, notice, they reach out now to others, right? And then David used this to build consensus of broad support, right? With all of them. Look at verse 3 and 4. It says, and let us bring again the ark of our God to us, for we inquired not at it in the days of Saul. Right? So he says, here's what we're going to do. Here's his proposal in verse 3. Bring back again the ark of God to us. Right? He's bringing this proposal across to everyone. He also brings out the reason why. Therefore, we inquired not at it in the days of Saul. You see, it's not just about do or, oh, you know, you must show your loyalty to the leader, you must follow everything he says. Uh, why we do what we do is important. And David shows that, you know, he brings out the problem case here, why this is important, right? They have not been inquiring of God as a nation, uh, neglecting coming to the ark, right, to God for a long time, since throughout the days of Saul, during his entire reign, and what he's saying is this, this must change. Here's a, here's a C word that's very unpopular in a lot of cultural Baptist churches today. Change. You see, here was the right kind of change. First, uh, whether this was it, whether it seemeth good. Secondly, whether it is of the Lord. And then here he said, you know, they've not been inquiring of, of, the, of, of the Lord throughout the days of Saul. Is this the right thing or not? Okay? Just because you, you, we hold on to, to tradition, right, blindly, doesn't mean that, oh, we are good because, right, we, we are holding on to the old paths. You're just a traditionalist. Right? A blind follower of men. Why? Because we hold on to the things that are right. We hold on to the things that are true. And if we have deviated from this, like what happened here, because they had not inquired of the ark and of God since the days of Saul, we need to fix it. We need to correct it now. You see what I'm saying here? And so what happens? Look at verse 4. They, they considered all these things, right? Remember, he's king, you know can do anything he wants. And yet, he brought this for their consideration. And, says, and all the congregation said that they would do so. For the thing was right in the eyes of all the people. Right? Now, notice this. They cut through the argument that people would put forth, okay? And especially in Baptist churches, what? Oh, we have, ne we have never done this thing before. This was not done. What do, what do they mean by that? By implication? Therefore, we will not do this. But look at this. It was not done by his predecessor, Saul. But it does not mean that it should not be done because the right thing is always the right thing to do. So he pushed ahead boldly, right, with something that was unprecedented. Again, like I said, something that is rare in many churches today. Look at his leadership style. He was consulted, okay, he consulted with them. He was not a dictator, all right? Then once they all agreed what happens, he worked with the leaders and, and those who had influence to um, get more buy-in and support from other leaders. Why? Because this is critical for success. Okay, let's move on. We're going to see David in leading the nation of Israel and then also as a leader personally. All right, he was very entrenched in his faith and focus. Okay, here is an incident in 1 Samuel chapter 30. All right, look at verse 3. David and his men returned back uh, to Ziklag. Okay, that was their base of operation. Uh, after being sent back by King Akish. And then, but what they saw when they arrived there shocked them to the core. All right, verse 3. Says, so David and his men came to the city, and behold, it was burned with fire. Can you imagine coming home and your house is burning on fire? All right, it's like, oh, what's going on? All right, and behold, it was burned with fire, and their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captives. Nobody was home. 
Everybody was taken. They're gone. And this hit them so hard, all right? It was not just some of the men, all the men, including David, were very badly affected by this. Verse 4, Then David and then and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. Have you ever been to a, gotten yourself to a point where, you know what, you have no more tears? You can't even cry about the matter anymore? Okay, I'm not talking about that you run out of tears from your tear ducts, you know. I'm talking about to the point where emotionally you are spent. There's nothing else. And that was where they were. All right? They were supposed to go to war. They got sent back, all right? They were, uh, because the other kings uh, did not trust them. They were sent back, and were, but they come back here and what happens? Everything that they had was gone, taken, burned with fire. Uh, they cannot find their wives. They cannot find their children. What are they going to do? This was a very distressing time. They were very discouraged. And here's what happens. And people who are distressed, people who are discouraged, they look for someone to blame. I know. Why? Because I'm a pastor. Happens to me all the time. People come for advice, right? Not that they wanted to hear. Right? I point out what, uh, what, what, what the Word of God has to say. They don't want to hear that. They go off, and they, oh, because right, they already decided what they wanted to do. They go out, make a mess, come back, it's my fault. I wish I saw that in the contract or the fine print before I signed up right, and surrendered as a pastor. But guess what? It comes with the territory. It comes with the territory. It's just what it is. Right? And so they were looking for someone to blame. Now, David understood that also. Right? But look at what happened. He was going through this personally. He was affected by this. He was not spared. Right? Verse 5, And David's two wives were taken captives, Ahinoam, the Jezreelites, and Abigail, the wife of Nabal, the Camelite. It's not as if, oh, it happened to his men and it didn't happen to him. Right? Oh, he was spared, so he doesn't understand what they're going through. He's going through exactly the same thing. Verse 6, And David was greatly distressed, but it wasn't just because he lost you know, his wives and then his children. It's worse than that. For the people spake of stoning him. It's his fault. Right? Wait, hang on. Now think about this. They all signed up to join with him. They knew the risk. They knew that um, it's possible, in fact, that they go out to battle, some of them are not going to come home. They're going to die. Some of them are going to die in battle. But they signed up with him. They, they joined him nevertheless. Now, what's happened here now is that um, a lot of times we are okay until there's a very major setback. Okay, some setback, no problem. Uh, difficulty, no problem. Uh, there's a lot of hard work and labor, no problem. But something major happens. And then what happens? Oh no, this changes everything. So now they are all thinking about stoning him, right? Because remember, in their minds, it's his fault. Because the soul of, the, of all the people was grieved for every man for his sons and his daughters. It's funny, they didn't talk about their wives. The details matter, <laughs> all right? You know this. Okay, the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord, his God. Right? Now, so here was what, what's happening now. He's going through the same thing that all of them are going through. Yet, notice, he's in the same boat with them, but to them, it's his fault. They want to kill him, stone him. Why? Because, because, I don't know. I don't know. Because how does that solve the problem? It doesn't. But then again, here's the problem. People who are caught up emotionally in a situation are not, they don't care about solutions. 
They need a way to deal with the emotions, to express it, to vent it, whatever. And in this case here, the anger, uh, they could not direct the anger at anybody, so David was the most obvious one. If you look at the, right, if you look at Israel in the wilderness, so many times what did, what happened? Something went wrong, something happened, there was a difficulty, they blame Moses, right? You and your stupid leadership. Why did I bother to follow you? Blah, blah, blah. You know, what is God trying to do to us? He's trying to get us all killed, right? He's trying to just um, leave us and our skeletons, our carcasses in the desert. He hates us. Okay? And they, they will vent this thing, but here's the thing, it doesn't solve the problem. Okay, remember, these are the men that he cared for. He's led, right? He he knows these people personally, and sometimes even the people closest to you can turn on you. Where was David to go? Now, notice something here. David had nowhere to turn to, no one to talk to except to the Lord, and he found his encouragement in the Lord. Dearly beloved, I, I just want to point out to you sometimes, you, the Lord will, can allow us to get to a point, a place, right, where we have nowhere, no one to turn to. And it's not because that the Lord hates us. He wants us to learn something. To always be dependent on Him and Him alone. Nothing else. Right? David now stood firm, even in the face of personally painful setbacks, and what he, what he did here is this. He demonstrated faith in front of his men. Okay, faith is not seen or demonstrated during the good times. Anyone can do that when times things are going well. What happens when things are going badly? All right? What happens when things are painful? What happens when things are, you know, you're hurting financially? Now we're going to see the true colors. David encouraged himself in the Lord. And here he led by example, right? Even when nobody was following. Why? It's important. Listen, you keep doing the right thing. You keep going in the right direction. Even if no one's following. Even sometimes we, we feel very, we're very discouraged. Why? I'm the only one. Why does it even matter? Keep going because God, is going to turn the situation around if we're patient, if we do not quit. Oh yeah, we talked about quitting last week, right? Don't quit. All right, think about this. David cared for all these parents, pastors, right? They care for others, but who cares for the one who's the caregiver? Hmm? That's why, you see, it's very important we maintain a close, strong, and vibrant relationship with the Lord because especially in the tough times, in the storms, and here we see, right, a very vivid example of the loneliness of leadership. Okay? Now, a couple of other thoughts here, okay, and then we'll get to some passages. The reality is this, setbacks will happen all the time, anytime. Okay? Okay? But here's the problem, right? Because fake leaders, those who are not led by God, you're going to see they will paint themselves as never, ever facing any setbacks or failure. Failure doesn't mean we've done something wrong. Okay? You study, if you look at the life of David, you're going to see that um, even in, First Chronicles 13, that was a set, major setback there. All right? Things happen. We can't prevent them. We can't control them. But we can deal with how we respond to this. All right? We don't derail just because of setbacks. All right? We don't uh, just quit because of discouragement and then we don't move forward. Okay? And here's the thing, right? There is a point where you have to now start working the problem instead of just venting the emotions. Okay? 
I'm going to, I'm going to say this because I, I just want to be very candid and open to everyone here because people have accused me of being uncaring and emotionless and that's not true. The only difference is this. Okay, because I'll tell you this as growing up as a kid, people make fun of me all the time because why? I was too emotionally sensitive. But I made it, ever since I was saved, I made it very clear to myself, I resolved one thing, all right? My faith must lead, not my feelings. I'll let God deal with the feelings. Okay? And just because I let God deal with the feelings doesn't mean I'm faking it. Or that I'm being dishonest. Hey, look, I could be grieving because there is a beloved family member or whoever who has passed away. But it doesn't mean I am not without the joy of the Lord or the joy of the Holy Ghost because God can deal with the rest of this. And just because the feelings are not in the driver's seat doesn't mean I don't feel anything. I can tell you this, I feel every bit of the that kind of criticism or insult because it was intended to hurt. But you know something? That's not the main thing. It's not the main thing. It is not the important thing. And David sought when he found his encouragement in the Lord, he also sought to find a solution to the current predicament. But you'll notice it's balanced. He allowed. There was time for the people to cry, to sorrow, but you can only do that much before you have to make a decision. What are you going to do from, from this point on? And what you have to do? You have to face the issues. Now, why did they then stone David? They loved him, right? They were loyal to him, yes. But understand this, not everyone has the same level of spiritual maturity nor faith that David had. Okay? Now, listen, you will understand this if you're a parent. Why? Because you know, your kids are growing up, they don't have the same uh, strength the same stamina, uh, all these other things that you have. Why? Because you're an adult. They're not. They're a very young child. So what do we do? We give allowance. You get what I'm saying? Yeah? We give allowance for that. We allow time to grow. Right? We allow uh, opportunities for, for them to learn. And David didn't just say, well, you know what? After all I've done for all you people, you know, you're ungrateful. Whatever. Okay, I'm done. I quit. Bye-bye. See you. And he walks away. No. What did he do? He continued to lead them, but he gave them space. All right? He, he provided us with a visible model of how to deal with major setbacks and adversity because they, the storms will come in this life. Okay? By the way, I did not even, while scheduling the hymn that we were singing just now, all right? I wasn't even planning that I would be preaching this message today. Okay, but I want us to realize here, David understands the limitations of his people just as a wise parent, a wise father, a wise mother, or a godly pastor ought to understand there are certain constraints and limitations. Okay, not everyone is at the same level of spirituality. That's why, notice this, the goal of the New Testament church is to bring everyone up to the similar level of spirituality and maturity. Look at Ephesians 4 verse 13. Notice this, it says here, till we all come in the unity of the faith, right? In, in the understanding, right, in terms of our doctrines and, and all that, it says, and the knowledge of the Son of God. This is personal knowledge has to do with a relationship. It says, onto a perfect man, onto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that Christ will be, will be and dwell richly and fully in each and every one of us. Now, all this is important for you and I as members of a New Testament church, right, to be able to function effectively. Verse 14, what was the end goal? So then, right, I'm just going to add that word, so. 
that we henceforth be no more children. You see that? The goal is what? Within this New Testament church that are uh, as God gives uh, the pastors, teachers, and all that, uh, you know, within the church and evangelists, now uh, all this to minister to the body, so that they come, they all come into the unity of the faith, right, and and the unity of the knowledge of the Son of God, right, to the fullness of Christ, that there will be no more children. Because what? Look at what happens to children: tossed to and fro. and carry it about with every wind of doctrine by the slay of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Notice what is this here, okay? And moms, today is Mother's Day, right? Notice, no, the goal isn't just to change diapers. It isn't just to uh, care or to feed. Raising up children, notice, is that so that they will no longer be children, I know, moms, you are, oh, I wish they would always stay so young and cute and so chubby, right? But the goal is that there will be no more children. Why? Because tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. Why? You see, children are gullible. You believe anything you tell them. If you teach them nonsense, they will believe it. And when you see here, but this is referring to a ch to members of a church. And when members can easily turn, change directions, and sometimes, a lot of times this happens when the pastor changes, they can change directions very quickly, right? To hold on, embrace a new set of doctrines that, was, that, was, that you're not going to find in the scriptures. And they don't have the ability, right? Because children, unlike adults, our adults can exercise critical thinking. They can discern. They can ask hard questions. What happens? They can notice they're tossed to and fro. You change the pastor, they go one direction. You change another pastor, they go another direction. And then they're tossed going back and forth, back and forth. Why? Here, notice they are immature spiritually. They have not grown. And notice the other thing. They are deceived because here it says they are carried about by the slay of men. Okay? Think of this as someone who's doing maybe magic card tricks and all that, right? And he's, uh, you know, through just very, very quick move and uh, through distraction, you didn't notice what he did. They pull a fast one on you. By the slay of men and cunning craftiness. Right? Cunning craftiness. I imagine, I can imagine, right? Because I, I've heard men who were leaders in their own church, and they say, you know, the last 15 years that they were deacons or whatever in that church, they did not know that the pastor held on to certain doctrines. Why? Because he never talked about them. He kept them hidden. I said, I told this person, there's no such thing as ninja doctrines. Stealth doctrines. If it's correct, if it's good, you shout it out from the rooftop. You declare it openly. Right? Is this your cunning craftiness now? Is it whereby they lie and wait to deceive? They'll teach you, they'll, you know, they'll, they'll draw you in with this and that, whatever, but then later, ah, I got you. Look at verse 15. How do we do this for one another? By speaking the truth in love. And sometimes speaking the truth may not be something we want to hear. Hmm? When Brother Roy or Brother Jack may tell me, you know, something, my attitude wasn't quite right. I listen. Because why? I trust them. They love me. They care about me. When they say something like that, it's not there because they're saying it to in order to hurt me because they want me, right, to be the best pastor that, I can be, that God can make me. Speaking the truth in love. There are churches that don't understand what this means. To them is, you must say nice things to us, even when we're wrong. Even when I'm lost. Nope. You know, the truth comes first. 
I can tell you this. I may be wrong for telling you the truth, maybe because I'm angry at you, okay? Clifton, I tell you, you know what? The house is on fire. <laughs> the only thing that matters is this. Is it on fire? Yes or no? If it is, you still need to do something about it. And sometimes, here's the thing, you know, that's why I take heed when enemies say things. Because why? They have no reason to, you know, lie to me in that sense. They know that the truth will hurt more. And here, all I can tell, Clifton, you, you need to go back home now because your house is on fire. Okay? Speaking the truth in love. But in either case, the truth is the truth. It doesn't change whether, because I do it in an unloving way or in a loving way. Should we, in the New Testament church, do speak the truth in love towards one another? Of course. It's commanded here. But it doesn't degrade the truth just because someone does not speak it in love. You see, when we the, our churches now become so fixed and focused on feeling good about ourselves, we lose the truth. We no longer care about that. We, we care more about the packaging rather than the contents. Okay? Seriously. Some people, I know today, some people, if you open up this beautiful box, all right, and they're like, oh, wow, oh, expensive, must be something beautiful, must be something expensive. Look. Okay. I, I'm pretty sure my wife, she, she's got her priorities correct. If I give her a small little crumpled plastic bag and there's a diamond ring inside, she'll be very happy. Okay. Rather than I give her a very beautiful box and there's a ring from a Coca-Cola can. Okay? That's a woman who's got her priorities all down. She, she evaluates the right things. But you, you know what I'm saying here. Because why? We are more concerned now about the packaging than about the truth. Right? So Now, how do we... Uh, some people say, okay, I want to go to a church. Uh, I, I want to leave. I want to go to another better church where I can grow, right? No, this is speak, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. How do we grow? When the truth is spoken often, openly, right? When the truth is brought across from the pulpits during the preaching or in our conversation with one another to why? Because it is to help one another to grow. Again, some people, I've heard people complain, ah, you know, oh, you're pounding, you know, the, the preacher is pounding on this thing and this thing and whatever, and then, you know, I'm not growing, I'm going to another church. Actually, the person, what the person, and I, this, this person used to be a preacher, was saying is this, he didn't feel good. He's going to go to another place that will make him feel good. Go for foot massage. Go get ice cream if you want to feel good. All right, get me a Wagyu steak, I'll feel good. But if you want to grow, all right, being grounded in the truth is very important, right? But that only works if we are saved. Now, let's move on because David was equitable in sharing victories. In other words, he was fair, right? He was uh, unbiased with everyone, and with his team. Now, notice he worked the plan to a counter-attack, right, and to re recover their families and everything that they lost. Now, 1 Samuel chapter 30, look at verse 17. Notice something here. And David smote them from the twilight even onto the evening of the next day. Now, time out here. Did he go in alone? No. He led his men. Nobody was in the mood. Am I right? They wept to their no more tears. No more strength left. But he led them nevertheless. Why? Because they still have to work the problem. And what did they do? 
he counterattacked, right? Chased them down. Now, what happens? They fought from the twilight, okay? Until the evening of the next day. So you, you, can you imagine? It's a long time. It's exhausting. It says, and they escaped not a man of them, save 400 young men. Out of the force that attacked and, and took everything away, they wiped out everybody except 400 survivors. Right? Say 400 young men which rolled upon camels and fled. So now, okay. Lah. You can't outrun a camel. Can't do anything about that. But he led his men to a victory, right? And secured a full recovery of everything that they lost. Verse 18, And David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away. All. All means all. Right? And David rescued his two wives. Okay? And there was nothing lacking to them. Neither small nor great, neither sons nor daughters, neither spoil, nor anything that, um, that they had taken to them. Right, David recovered all. Everything that they lost was fully recovered. Can't argue with that. Okay? But then now came the matter of, okay, what about the 400 that escaped, right? And they will pursue them. So verse 21 says, And David came to the 200 men, which were so faint that they could not follow David. Now, what happened in between was this. They tried to pursue these 400. His men, some of his men, 200 of them, were so tired, so exhausted, they could not continue. And notice one more thing here. As I mentioned earlier on, now David understood the limitations of everybody. Okay? And so what did he tell them? Okay, those 200 men, he told them, all right, all the stuff that we have right now, remember, they attacked, they recovered everything down. They had a lot of things. Right? Now, it's not just equipment. It's not just loot. It's, uh, remember, wives, sons, and daughters. Cattle. That's a lot of things. Obviously, if you got all this stuff, there's no way you can pursue and chase after the enemy. Here was a situation, 200 men, now it's a problem, they cannot continue the fight. It's time out here, ask yourself this question, right? Is it a problem? Or could this be the solution to a problem? Why? Because I know, I know, I know people who, they look at it, no, you, you better work hard, you know, you gotta keep going, you know, uh, you, uh, whatever it is, we're gonna go, we're gonna go, why? Because Many times when the leader says that, it is about him. It's about them. Okay? Sadly, sometimes it's the pastor. Right? And everyone may be hurting financially, whatever, and you know, you've got to continue. You know, we're going to give, we're going to, whatever, we have this project, and with that, you know, whatever, and we'll push people beyond their limits. Now, what did he do? 200, they had to sit this out, okay? He said, okay, here's all the stuff, right? That includes... Remember, the wives, women, right, the children, right, the sons and daughters, all that stuff. They say, okay, you got them. Now, tell me that is not an important role. It is. Am I correct? Is that important? Yes. That was why they went there, right? That was why they were so upset when all they lost all that. Okay, now he got these 200 men who could not go to continue, right, which was a problem, but here he saw the opportunity. Okay, you guys stay here. By this brook, guard everybody. I would say that's a very important role. Right? Now, David comes back to them, right? It came to the 200 men, which were so faint that they could not follow David, whom they had made also to abide at the brook Besor. And they went forth to meet David and to meet the men, uh, the people that were with him. And when David came near to the people, he saluted them. He greeted all of them. Right? Now, Notice this. There was a new problem. Because there were some others who were not happy about that situation. Look at verse 22. Then answered all the wicked men and men of Belial. Now, when you, the, in the Old Testament, when you hear and see this expression, right, men of Belial, now these are not just useless men, they're wicked men. Okay? They do not know the Lord. And here, what happens? These now came up to David. It says, with all the wicked men and men of Belial, of those that went with David. So there were others that followed David to pursue in the battle. Now, 
They came up to him and said, right, because they went not with us, we will not give them all of the spoil that we have recovered. Okay? What was the spoil? The spoil of the battle, right? Because when you destroy the enemy, you take also their supplies. You take whatever they have. And for many soldiers back in those days, right, the spoil and the loot, now those were a very big part of their pay. Their salaries are small. Right? But if they kill the enemy and they, you know, the guy's got a Rolex gold, Rolex watch, I guess that's mine now. Right? All the pasalubong, right? All the all the souvenirs and all these things, right? He's got a gold ring, he's got uh okay, dead enemy, right? Gold tooth, whatever. All those things have value. Now they say, okay, all those things we collected, we're not gonna distribute and share. Not with those people. They they won't did not come with us to this fight. Right? So what were they proposing? Says, um, we will not give them all of the spoil that we have recovered. Save to every man his wife and his children that they may lead them away and depart. Right? So he said, okay, we're going to give them back their, wife, their wives and the children and then we're going to tell them goodbye. Get lost. You're no longer part of us. Right? They, in other words, they're proposing what? Expelling all these people. Now what did David do? He vetoed this immediately. Verse 23, he says, Then said David, Ye shall not do so, my brethren. And I like how he says, you know, you know, we're brethren. Okay? Ye shall not do so, notice, with that which the Lord had given us, who had preserved us and delivered the company that came against us into our hand. This is every... Now, notice how he changes the direction. Why? Because he said, look, we went and we continued to pursue after the enemy. We did the hard work, right? We risked ourselves. We put in all the sweat. You know, we could have died, you know, so on and so forth. Now, notice he directs everything, puts everything back into perspective. He says, it was the Lord that had given us these things. It's the Lord who had preserved us. It was the Lord that had delivered that com the company that came against us into our hand. So what are you talking about? You get what I'm saying here? He changes the perspective. And this is a very important thing, right? As a mom, right? As a dad, as a, as a, in that role of leadership, anyone in the role of leadership, now you have to frame the perspective back again to remind people of what is really going on and what matters. In this case here, what God has been doing. You get what I'm saying here? What God has been doing, because we, a lot of times, what is very powerful and affects many of us, okay? I'm pretty sure everyone here, you've been in situations where you were discouraged. What happens is this, we... What is very powerful for us is this. We see the situation, the circumstances around us. But what you lack is this. Someone to remind you with a correct perspective, hey, what God is doing. What is really happening behind the scenes from a spiritual perspective. And David said, you know what? It's the Lord that had given us uh, all this, uh, who had preserved us. They didn't lose a single thing. Right? and had delivered the company that came against us into our head. The enemy was destroyed. So, verse 24 says, For who will hearken unto you in this matter? Notice, why am I listening to all this? Am I going to listen to you? Is it? But as his part is that goeth down to the battle, so his part... Uh, so shall his part be that tarrieth by the stuff, they shall part alike. Why? Because, to be honest, the group that went and pursued, continued to pursue after the enemy, they would not have been able to do so if these 200 were not there to support them. And you see, many times, and I've seen this ruin churches so many times that so much focus, attention is on whoever's doing the stuff on the front line who is visible, who may be getting the so-called 
who may be in the spotlight. When I'm very mindful a lot of times of the people who are working behind the scenes. Many times the ladies quietly doing things behind the scenes. Nobody seems to notice, but I can tell you this. No one will bother about the audio team until something goes wrong. Am I correct? You expect the sound to be clean, all right, uh, without interruption, without static, without all sorts, without noise and all that stuff. But when something goes wrong, or everyone starts to pay attention to them. Because why? In those kind of roles and, and jobs, what happens is this. A job well done is when nobody even thinks that you are doing any work. It's running so smoothly, you don't notice it. And then what happens when something is late? Something doesn't go up, right? Uh, sometimes it's like, I do a lot of stuff behind the scenes. And then what happens? Uh, oh, this week we did, we're not able to upload the, you know, the video or the recording on, on YouTube. And people start asking, oh, what happened? What happened? What happened? These 200 helped them, all right, and guarded their wives, children, and all that, so that they were able to get those other things done. Otherwise, it would not have been possible. They would have all had to, you know, try to move their family along or they cannot even pursue after the enemy. Now, can I say this? Many times, here's what happens. Moms, as a wife, you play a very important supporting role, which is often underappreciated. Right? And there are folks who will take on certain roles. We, they work behind the scenes. And I've always been tr mindful that I take notice of those things. Why? Because they're important. And the people fulfilling those roles need to be encouraged also. And so David said, no, I'm not with whom will list hearken unto you in this matter. We're not listening. I'm not listening to this. And then notice something here. David demonstrated, right, the kind of leadership which is based on principles and convictions. Because here, you notice, he went against the popular sentiment. Just like earlier on, right, he stood alone. Here, he went against the popular sentiment. The, the, the lou loudest voices were saying, you know what, we will not share the spoils of the battle. Let them just take their wife and children. Let them go. We don't want to have anything to do with them anymore. And he said, no, I'm not doing that. All right? He stood against this us versus them mentality. Okay, now, time out here, because here's what happens. Cowardly leaders will go with the crowd, with the, what is the popular sentiment, instead of doing what is right. Right? The unprincipled leaders, now, many times they are, they love, okay, they love everybody as long as everybody is supporting them. But the moment it doesn't go their way, next thing, they become the dictator. It must be done my way or the highway. Right? The highway, why? Right? You go take a hike. Now, what happens here? He made it clear. He was not going to accept that proposal. Right? But, and what was his reason? Because all of them played an important role and part in all this. In the success of this, everyone contributed. Did they all contribute in the same way? No. But you will know because why right, the 200, that by doing what they did, it made it possible for the rest to be able to be victorious. I would say that, that they played the more, you know, they pulled their weight. All right? And so he was so adamant about this principle that it was made a law or rule in Israel even until today. Now notice this in verse 25. 
And it was so from that day forward that he made it a statute and an ordinance for Israel unto this day. Why? Because here he recognized the importance of the group. Okay, the team. Because their proposal would have destroyed the team. Okay. And here he recognized, right, that this was important. And yet at the same time, our roles, our tasks are different. We all contribute to the same goal. Everyone in the group may be different. He understood their limitations also. Because everyone, listen, right now, if I, I if sure, maybe if I say, okay, we shall now have a test to see who can continue to stay awake for as long as possible, I'll probably win. Right? I can probably go for 36 to 40 hours. Okay? And someone here, maybe by 10.30 tonight, you are out cold. We're different. Not everyone has the same strengths and weaknesses, but we are part of the same team. And being joined as members of one another, or being joined as members of a, for instance, a New Testament church, right? or being joined as part of a family, what happens? Um, we all work together. Right, we all function together. Right here, David made it very clear: they share the same future, the same directions, the same risk, and the same rewards, the same victories. Okay, everyone wants to share the victory and the rewards. How happens? Oh, but major setback, or oh, brother Jack, or oh, that one. Now uh, you take care of yourself. Okay, see so you. Don't, don't call me. Wait a minute. Look at what the Apostle Paul said. All right, in 1 Corinthians 12. Okay, he was writing with respect to being joined as members of a New Testament church, which he described to us as a, likens it to a human body. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 25. That there should be no schism in the body. Right, no split, no division. But that the members should have the same care one for another. Okay? We care for one another the same way. Not just, there's no, so someone has special status, okay? And a lot of times today, it's like the pastor has like much more special status and who cares about the rest, right? No, this is it. Same care one for another. Verse 26, and whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. We feel the pain. We've, we, we understand what they're going through. All One member be honored. All the members rejoice with it. Then notice what he says in the next verse. Now, ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. But notice how he addressed it. Who did he address this to? Those who were in Corinth. Ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. But notice this. If the last three years, very simple. You know something? You can't cut, you can't isolate this. You, you know, you can't say, oh, okay, my big toe has COVID. All right? But my nose is okay. So who cares? It spreads. It's all over. The body is connected. Right? You get infected in one part, it, the infection spreads elsewhere. And understand this, as members one of another in the, a, a church, what happens, what happens to one part of the body affects the other. Good things, we all enjoy that, but guess what? We also share in the other, the negative side. And we come to each other's help, come to each other's aid. Right? Uh, we encourage one another through all this. Now, let me just jump straight to the con my concluding thoughts here. All right, let me conclude with this. Now, David engaged and involved all the leaders. All right. It didn't matter whether they were the highest leaders or those at the bottom, right? Anyone who wielded influence. My question to everyone is this, okay? If God has put you in a position of leadership, 
right? Sometimes it's informal. Sometimes it is in a position of influence, right? And today we're in the day and age, right? There's a lot of talk about social influences and all that. Hey, my question will be this. As a spiritual influencer, will you surrender that to allow God to direct you that you will be a blessing right, and a godly influence to others? You need to decide. David was very entrenched in his faith and focus. All right, despite, despite the painful personal setbacks. All right, I'm not talking about you and I coming here today, this morning. Uh, Hi, everything's okay. But what I'm saying is that we can go through very painful things and yet still be a encouragement and a blessing to others. How? By the grace of God. By the comfort that God gives to us through His Holy Spirit. David was equitable and fair, right? In sharing his victories, right? He understood, okay? He stood on principle. It wasn't just based on the sentiment. Now, I will say this, no? a lot of churches, where they've gone crazy is they're fixed on being sentimental instead of stepping back and saying, okay, what is right, what is wrong, and what is good? And so David demonstrated a godly example. Now, he wasn't infallible. Okay, Some leaders like to portray themselves they can never do wrong. They are always correct. They are always perfect. Uh, he was authentic. Okay, What do we mean by that? He was not perfect. But what you want is this, right? Whether as a parent, as a mom today, right, being Mother's Day or, uh, or as a dad or as a leader, is this. You don't have to be perfect. But you have to be someone led by the Lord. You have to be someone that is the real deal, authentic. Why? Right? Because while you're not perfect, people should be able to see, yes, where you're wrong, there's a turning, there is a repentance, there is a growing, there is a maturing. Right? Like with each year, you while we're not sinlessly perfect, but guess what? We're growing. We're becoming, you know, we're different from where, let's say, 10 years ago. And David demonstrated courage and conviction by standing on what is right, okay? Even if this was not done before, all right? With King Saul and what happened with the ark, it could have been the last 30, 40 years. Guess what? What about before that? Right? And that's why, you see, the Word of God is important. I'm not interested in what, let's say, Baptist churches have been doing the last 40, 50 years because this tells us what we should be doing over the last 2,000 years. And so I, my answer to many who say, wow, you know, Pastor Jesse's changing things. Well, that's because where many Baptist churches have been in the last 50 years, have, we have moved away and that direction is not a good direction. I want to move things back to where, okay, you can verify this in the scriptures. You can check this out in the history books. Because right, we have historical references and documents and books. Rather than follow the traditions, the modern traditions of men. And that's why I tell them, well, your context of history is very narrow. Last 40, 50 years. I'm going back further than that. And so he's not afraid to push in into a new direction. He's not afraid to do a course correction to bring things back to where they ought to be. Right? And he was not afraid to stand alone, where, even though on what is right, even though he is outnumbered. Now, my question is this how many of us today will come before the Lord and be willing to say, Lord, that's what I need to stand on? This is the right thing. Lord, give me strength. Give me courage, give me boldness, right? To do what is right, even in a day and age where, you know, things have changed so much, where, um, you know, every man doeth that which is right in their own eyes. But you know something? We have this to show us where we need to go. And it may be that we need to go back 
head back, do a cost correction to realign. But who today will come before the Lord and say, Lord, this is what I want to do. Give me strength and grace by the aid of the Holy Spirit and through the power of your word. Let's pray. Father, we thank you.